Greetings, everyone. Nathan Nerdark here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds, and I'm hanging out with a nerd. I am Canada, and tonight we shall discuss horrible futures and possibly happy bunny-filled ones. Or horrible futures with the veneer of happy bunny fluffy <laughs> ones over top. Yeah, this could get this could get extremely convoluted. I I think like the best starting point for us tonight is going to be to define in broad terms because the more specific we are the worse this is going to get. So in broad terms, what is a utopia? <laughs> oh god, it's a monkey bob question. <laughs> and what is a dystopia? All right, well, I would just say in broad terms a dystopia, I'm going to go with dystopia first, is a imagined place that is in some way bad enough or there's there's enough wrong things about it or it's a, a good idea implemented poorly that just sifts the whole of society, kind of like any facet you would want to really look at it. Um, there's just like some wrongness to it. It doesn't have to be obvious on all levels but it's got to be it's got to be like the underlying theme there's there's something there's something rotten about it there's something rotten under this city okay so a a a overwhelming idea of things have gone south in just everyday life in society, whatever form that may take, in the structure of order, it's just wrong. Now, I would say for dystopia, we're also looking at dystopian, probably for, since we're talking about <clears throat> campaign setting and adventures and things, we're going to be looking at dystopia from the perspective of the people who are going to play the game. So basically, if you're making a character or you're telling a story within it, it's dystopian from that layer. People at the top might think it's an awesome place, all 24-7, mm -hmm. all the time. But wherever you are, wherever your story is happening, wherever the player characters are, it's dystopian. Or, and of course, or it's going to be discovered to be dystopian. The, the most important thing here is perspective, right? A dystopian setting is really easy to sell to an American. Because... An American probably has never been insanely hungry, or most Americans uh, probably have never had to deal with some of the more horrible things that you're creating as norms for this setting. Uh, like, I've never had a creature break into my home and eat my family members. But in a dystopian setting, maybe that's the kind of thing that could happen to people. <clears throat> So the the perspective, the ability to say at some point things were not like this. They got bad and now this is the setting. Yes. And as far as utopia, it's basically in, in the broad sense of it, it's a place that's so good it's practically too good to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times, like we were saying, dystopia is just a utopia where you figured out where it's crummy who who is it crummy to be in this perfect world the upper city and the lower city yeah or perhaps um you failed an exam and the way that we keep the resources you know enough resources for everyone is we off the people who don't pass the test so right. if you're one of those people that don't pass the test guess what you've just hopped right into a dystopia right and there are lots and lots of common premises for this kind of thing uh, uh fifth element I love Fifth Element. Fifth Element had the dystopia utopia. Lots of people who were doing pretty okay got to love above the smog. Anybody else lived in downtown, which was literally down, and it was so smog-filled that you couldn't see 15 feet. I mean, clearly those kinds of living conditions would be bad. Judge Dredd, dystopia. At some point, that city was opulent and beautiful and a wonderful place to live, but then they kept packing more and more people into it and you end up with a dystopian setting. Um, the Shire, that's a great example, hodgepodge <laughs> syntaxia. The, the, the idea of the Shire, this peaceful location, everyone has what they need. They have hobbits who live there who live off the concept. Context, again, is very important here. They're, they have multiple meals a day. 
before breakfast, after breakfast, Smoke lunch, leaf, and, whenever. Yeah, exactly. Finest weed in all the Shire. So these people have this perfect idealistic life, but try to keep in mind the only reason we think that is because we live in a setting where maybe we can't eat seven meals a day and we won't live to be 114 and there isn't chirping birds in summer days every single day so yeah and you can't sit around on your porch smoking whatever whenever so you know exactly th- like exactly. passing the time away idly most of the time if you weren't like gardening or farming or whatever and i have to say that before bilbo went to on his adventure he was pretty well off yeah, he was doing good. Yeah, his parents did well by him. So, I mean, I don't think he had a profession, actually, yeah. before. So he was a he was definitely a gentleman hobbit, a, I think. Yeah, he was a point. Baggins. Yeah, he was a Baggins at, of Bag End. Yeah. So he was, an, he was like an elder family there. He had a street named after him. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so... So as far as as far as we're concerned, looking at like Hobbit life, well, I was like, well, there's ones that actually did work. And I feel like the Shire, like you, story elements. So this is a good point about the story elements. The Shire was supposed to be that like idyllic country farm kind of feel mm-hmm. where everything's just chill and cool and everybody gets gets along unless you're a little off. Everybody's like well fed. The crops apparently are the most immaculate crops ever. Did you see that carrot the Hobbit was carrying, man? Yeah. You need some good soil to produce a carrot like that. So anyway, yeah. yeah and also, uh, aside from the few people that they kind of did a little shunning because they were a little off, were mm-hmm. too mu- too adventurous, is it seemed like what was what was the antithesis to the idyllic sure. Hobbit, Hobbit life. Uh, you know, so if you weren't if you weren't that social group, everything was awesome, pretty much. Yeah. So so. Right. Uh, Vicky T said soft apocalypse causing dystopia. We haven't exactly decided on what, what we would be using or how would we be approaching creating a dystopian setting or a utopian setting. Um, I feel like defining what you want to do for either is the more important step. Why do I think this is utopia? Why do I think this is dystopia? And the reasons behind, um, like, why are you using it? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so if you're, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a storyline or you don't have a story you want to tell, then I mean, I mean, if you just like making dystopian futures or dystopian altered history kind of things, well, then then that's your thing. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, some of us really enjoy that the story elements of developing those things, and um, it's definitely a popular genre. Yeah. And there's a, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but we don't need to go into all that. But I would say, you know, what what level of story do you want to tell? Do you want to? Is it like your the player characters resistance fighters? Are they people that all for some reason kind of fell through the cracks of a utopian society, and they're discovering mm-hmm. that it's not that great if you fell? You know, if if you fall through the system, and because all the things that would normally make it a great place, you're you're that odd person out that doesn't that doesn't get caught by that filter. A peasant during the Crusades. Well, I mean, they if were, were kind of crummy. That was a kind of crummy time <laughs> compared. If to you me. were wealthy, you were doing okay. If you were not wealthy, you were at the bottom of the heap, like the bottom bottom of the heap, living a really brutally bad life. So, um. Oh, I mean, you okay, and conscript it into the Crusades? I can see that being a problem. But, mm. I mean, being a farmer is not terrible. <laughs> in, in medieval Europe in that period of time, it was terrible. It was, it was if, you, if you go read, kind of like being a child in the Victorian era. You'd be like, well, it can't be that tough to be a kid in the Victoria era. It can if you work 14 or 16 hour days. Oh, yeah, machine. Standard. Yeah, Children working in a shop. Were... Okay. What's that? Yeah, working in a shop in that era. Yeah, that's an issue. Well, okay. So another thing, uh, potato famine. That's a good point. You know, bringing up a, a disaster or a situation that that basically jump starts a, a like precipitating towards some kind of uh, unwanted future. Hmm. 
my my personal favorite method is bad thing and then the way to solve the bad thing is not such a great solution yeah, uh and this is like rehashed a million times what was the name of that movie <sighs> where there's the gun kata uh <clears throat> yes i know what you're talking about equilibrium or something right equilibrium bad things happen the solution is not great you end up with a uh horrible apocalyptic dystopia that tries to bring itself out with the idea of a utopia but it's only in a, a utopia to one or two people the people at the very very top to everyone else it's a dystopian well, they don't get to feel the people at the top weren't weren't following the rules either which is yeah, exactly. which is another thing that happens uh, you know, in in the in those kind of things is where you have people where you're like, oh, these are the rules that you're supposed to follow, and either people breaking the rules at the top disrupt how the system works enough that it kind of it falls towards this dystopia, mm -hmm. like basically their abuse of the system that wasn't so bad uh, lends itself to that, and at that point they're they're tyrants, they're usurpers, they're they're all these other things, they're revolutionaries that have actually created a worse place than what you start it with. And that's that's a way that you can have kind of like a dystopian future that's not locked in. I felt mm -hmm. like Brave uh Brave New World that was a just that was showing a dystopian future that was pretty much set how it was going to be. While like more of the like 1984 feel was more of like well you feel like you maybe you could change it possibly. <laughs> you could probably play player characters in 1984 and like reasonably overthrow the system no but, thank you but uh, that's horrible a, horrible thing that's a rough climb mm, the french revolution yeah uh we we are talking uh fantasy settings that's what we're talking we're talking trying to come up with some kind of um uh open now i have a dystopian setting that i have built uh that's that uh i went through all the steps for publication with uh that is a steampunk setting it's not a 5e D, D setting uh but we've actually discussed nate and i have discussed uh me possibly taking that setting and putting it somewhere doing something useful with it rather than letting it languish on top of my filing cabinet so well now it's it's languishing on top of your filing cabinet and on my hard drive because I have yeah, a copy, yeah. <laughs> but I, I like it so far. I'm enjoying it, and uh, I'm interested in doing something with it. So we'll have to figure we'll have to figure that out. You know, in between, do something. in between all of the other things going on, a million other things you're doing. Yes, yes, all the other the, the list of things is is quite long, and it keeps to get it keeps getting longer. Uh, but yeah, Curtis. but not any not any specific, not any specific thing, but just like what. What do you, I guess the question, we're going to put the question to the audience is what kind of elements do you kind of feel need to be, or you think make a good kind of backdrop? Can you can craft some good story elements or, or stories out of like certain dystopian effects? So, um, like, is there something like strange and crazy being done to the general populace? Like they're all being drugged or they're all, they're all being put in jars. I don't know. Like, you know what? What kind of, like, disruption of what you would say is normally... Like, what kind of disruption to, like, what the, the the current system that you might enjoy? That mm. you'd say would be, like, a complete, like, overturning or alteration to the point. And I mean, I mean like, we're talking... Uh, we mostly play fantasy D and D. I mean, we could do modern D and D, but for the most part, we're talking like fantasy. So you're thinking like, what, what, like how the majocracy, the majocracy talk we had. I felt like yeah. that was really steering, especially with the creepy guys you talked about, <laughs> the the Raven Watchers and the um, <clears throat> the uh, the people hunting magic users, uh, sniffing Curtis, out. <clears throat> Curtis Stinson, it, tell us. I'm not sure what you're saying, tell us. If you're saying tell us as in me tell you my setting, that would take upwards of 20 minutes, and I don't think we want to devote 20 minutes of conversation to me literally reading stuff to everyone. Um, 
forced equality equality cannot be forced because equality is inherent everyone's inherently equal uh so it can't be forced um a lack of equality represents a deficiency in a system so um in my opinion uh hodgepodge syntaxia said in my opinion the simplest way to develop a dystopia is a political system religion technological development or magical developments that's gone too far um i used a combination just a synopsis i used a combination of technological and uh, magical development in order to cripple humanity's progress and then human humanity tries to progress again but with the crippling blow it's taken so mm. um you've Gee. got a super quizzical look on your face what's going on heartburn sorry <clears throat> <clears throat> i needed to <clears throat> excuse me so uh hodgepodge let's see yeah you read that okay Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, well, with the dystopian thing that we were working with, the mageocracy, that empire that was developed, that's pretty much a dystopian empire. Like, there's, mm -hmm. there's, it's not terrible because you've got magic doing stuff for you, but that, you know, if you wanted to switch that to modern, well, technology is taking care of a lot of the normal things that you would, on average, suffer at that time frame. So for modern, there's certain te technology stuff that happens, and that leads towards dystopia, or you have <clears throat> where you're talking about uh, in the fantasy setting where magic is taking care of a lot of the ails people are getting healed they're not they're not dying as young due to some kind of just random disease the farms are doing great because people are growing crops with magic you know all those kind of things <clears throat> all those kind of things add to this kind of uh, bringing up of a society but also at the same time uh, cr clamping down on either freedom or the ability to make choices in this case, mm -hmm. you know, people couldn't perform, people weren't allowed to do kind of like unrelegated magic. Yes. And to a certain extent, it wasn't just, it, to a certain extent, it made sense because you don't want just want people launching fireballs because they were upset with somebody. Mm. But on the other hand, you know, did you have to go that far? It's kind of like you have a magical disaster with someone and then you swing the pendulum way too far to the other way. And you really clamp down on the ability of people to use their, you know, free choice of what they do with their magic, what they do with their technology, that kind of thing. Well, I, here's, here's a great example of the utopia dystopia kind of debate, how you would classify it. And this is for chat. What would you consider Superman exists DC universe style, but not the rest of the universe, just the DC movies where Superman's there. Is Superman's presence, does that turn your world into a utopia? Or does that turn your world into a dystopia? Because I could make arguments for both. Um, the right to bear fireballs. Uh, Vicky T said, habitat lot e loss equals starvation, cannibalism, genetically modified animals equals havoc on the ecosystem, then genetically modified humans as people, We'll try anything to survive. Uh, there's a variety of things in uh, Stargate SG-1. The, uh, the Asgardians are essentially living in a dystopian world where they're no longer able to propagate or perpetuate their species. Um, so they have their existence to... until, they, until they fade away and that's it. Yeah, and then that's it. So that's technically a dystopian future for them. And they're the good guys and so it's very tragic to see the good guys dying out like that but that's that's a dystopian setting um i would say the world that the humans live that they participate in in stargate sg1 those humans live in a utopian future they live or past at this point because it was like 2000 when those shows were taking place but uh, I would say their world's utopian. They're getting all of this new technology that can make their lives better. And I'll grant you the team is dealing with tons and tons and tons of bad problems, but society in general, which is what you would measure that future by society in general has a really good life. Well, okay. So we're still on the Stargate stuff. 
I'm just I'm just giving examples. Okay, so an example of turning that into dystopia, like for so you have the um, the Stargate team, for example. What mm -hmm. if they were forced because it was a high mortality rate, and basically they were using any which way person they could to deal with stuff that comes through the gate or deal with acquiring positions, almost like almost like um the way people gear up for like in a uh, starship troopers, how they gear up for war, you know, mm -hmm. Oh, we're like, we offer you all this other kind of stuff, but instead it's more just dy dystopian in the sense that they're sending you out there with the expectation that most of you aren't going to come back at all. And would it's you not, like to know more? And it's not volunteerism. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. you failed a test or you've passed a certain test and you're going to do this. Yeah. Conscription. But so, there is, there's two sides of that. Yes, the battles that they're fighting in Starship Troopers are really, really bad and really gory. And they know that there's going to be a lot of deaths. But at the same time, they're living in a utopian society. That society is, you don't get to vote unless you've given military service. Apparently, their leaders are really good leaders. There are hints at a dystopian society, like the fact that they're having public executions on like cable channels. Um, but still, if you look at the lives of the, the young adults that joined the military, they had exceedingly good lives. They're highly educated. They're very healthy. They live in good, they have good home lives. And then they go out to fight battles where things get bad. But I would say in general, the society is, is utopian. Well, heading towards that direction. Cause I feel like utopian we like all, along the path towards it. I, it's it's like better than average is what you, what you're saying, right? Are you saying mm -hmm. better than average or like, I feel like utopians up here and like better than average is like, yeah, being highly educated, being well-fed, being healthy, all those kind of things high, like head in, in that direction. In my book, uh, utopia is living at uh, incredibly high quality of life. Um, right now for the majority uh, of the populace. for the majority right for the majority of the populace on earth today we do not live in a utopian society because there's so much need that is not being fulfilled mm -hmm. so in order to transition to a utopian society to put it lightly a lot more people would go to bed with full bellies tonight um, speaking upon that, Hodgepodge Syntaxia, Utopia for the many at a cost of a few is still a dystopia for a few. That's that's a great point. We talked about that earlier. You can have what looks to be a dystopia. I mean, looks to be a, a utopia, and you're going to have the the characters that you want to run through a story be those few that don't fit into the system, that aren't caught by all the different uh, mechanisms for keeping people at a certain level. So when you have all these healthy fit people um, all all this different kind of benefits for those people. There are going to be a few people that there's some mark that's off. Maybe they just say, hey, I've got a particular desire to not do X, Y, Z thing, so I'm going to drop off the map. Well, that person doesn't have a, a credit stick in their finger and they can't do X, Y, Z things. They can't, they can't even rent a car. They can't, they can't buy anything. They can't, so they're like living off the land in the wild. And maybe to them, they're like, this is way better than that crazy place where everybody is the same. Mm -hmm. So there's there's always those outliers, even in even in an actually well designed and well even in a well designed situation where like ninety nine point nine nine percent of people are are just fine, there's still that point zero one percent when you have a million people, that's actually a significant number of people are outside or outliers of the system so you can always run a game in a utopia with it with it being dystopian and that's what makes it dystopian it's dystopian from that point of view it's a dystopian from those people so mm. that's that's like i think a, a major point i wanted to get across is you can have a utopia that is dystopian for the, the few that you run the story for it's all the perspective and the same thing for the dystopia. It can be a utopia for the five percent. Well, you could you could play that five percent. It's kind of like playing vampires in Vampire the Masquerade. You're the you're the high you're the echelon at that point. I mean, oh, I don't want to be a vampire. That's a dystopia for me. I don't want to be. A vampire. <laughs> All right, well, I am not killing anybody. Say they're happy with being vampires. Then it yeah, would be but that, you that, know they're 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 like the apex predator. That's monkey paw, man. That's. 
you're talking vampires have to kill people in order to live that cost is not a price i would ever be willing to pay that's why i always played a werewolf <laughs> yeah get rid of those guys yeah. So I was like, we'll kill off the bloodsuckers. I have several remarks as far as Superman is concerned. Okay. Uh, Superman would depend on how much he actively polices people and whether or not he was actually a flawless paragon. I'd probably lean towards dystopia, though. Um, then Vicky T, dystopia, because there's always someone who would try to announce Superman as a threat to kill. He's too powerful to leave alone. Uh, Curtis Stinson, well, if I live in a place where Superman never comes, the crime will migrate there. Versus if I live near Superman, I am safe, but other people will try to live closer to him, so overcrowding. I can poke so many holes in Superman and just how bad it would be if Superman were in our world that I can confidently say I'm really glad Superman's pretend. <laughs> there are so imagine. many reasons it would be bad it's like oh superman lives on fifth avenue you know this address and the closer you are to where he like sleeps at night <laughs> the more expensive it gets yeah what is superman's moral playbook you don't know you don't know what if he's having a real bad day he might microwave a section of uh, the city or or fighting causing he he decides in superman's infinite wisdom i have to let this person die to save these other two people even if there really wasn't a choice even if i would have had to make that same choice the exact same way now superman's an enemy because he let someone die and he's superman so to public opinion he shouldn't have let that happen There's no easy way out for Superman. He'd show up and be like, mm, too complicated. I'm out. You guys deal with your own crap. Moving on. <laughs> uh, along the moral question of like, oh, letting someone die to save other people. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea, uh, hodgepodge, if a society made everyone work like dogs until they were 40 and then let them live out the rest of their lives in the lap of luxury, assuming the average lifespan is 50, would it be utopia or dystopia? And that's going to be whether or not you're okay with that system. Pretty much, it's it's similar to like you know a lot of people. You could say someone who is a has an entrepreneurial spirit might not like the idea that pretty much you're supposed to just go get a job at somebody else's job at somebody else's business. So mm -hmm. they go all and they and they'll strive. But imagine it's people just said, no, you can't do that. You can only go to works for somebody else. Let's say that's like that's the way it is well you would have a terrible time and you'd be miserable a lot with the idea that you were stuck being an employee of somebody else when in, in reality you want it to be this certain level of, of living even if it was hard you want it to do the things for yourself well you're mentally going to be under duress the whole time pretty much and i i will say that take this dystopia uh, uh, utopia argument with you when you go to see the new Avengers movie. I will not say any spoilers, I promise. But take this take this concept of dystopia utopia with you when you go to see the new Avengers movie. At some point, you will be like, "Ooh, ooh!" <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't, I can't wait to see yeah. it now. Mm, it's fantastic. This is a really excellent movie. I am, I am not being paid for this review. <laughs> it is a movie. Um, okay, so let's let's do this. How do we build a utopia? Let's do the impossible challenge. <laughs> Dysto dystopia is easy. I've written a hundred dystopian settings. Yeah, you know utopia what? It's tough. I I've written <laughs> plenty of. Whoop, sorry, that was way too loud. Um, I've written plenty of dystopian stuff myself, and I have to say, um, utopia, in my opinion. A utopia is simply a dystopia you haven't figured out what's broken yet. So that's kind of my opinion. Are on you sure? Yes. Because there was a man who was much smarter than you or I, as far as these settings are concerned, and he made a very convincing utopia that didn't have anything wrong with it. <laughs> I'm going to say with confidence that there is no such place. 
So I'll frame it as a, as a world history and then my fellow nerds can pick up on where I'm headed and they'll get the idea. So, okay, mankind has a bunch of wars, nukes itself, has a really bad time, comes back out of the wars, starts to figure things out, gets some advanced technology, uses the advanced technology to start exploring space, meets some aliens and starts hanging out with those aliens. They become best bros. Are you done yet? And then, and then as they start to expand further and further into space, they start to develop technologies that make it so that all of the things you would normally need are very easy to produce. So they get rid of things like currency. They get rid of like everyone can get an education. Everyone can have medical care. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm going to say a place and a system in which people are murdered by transporter every day and then <laughs> copies of them with different consciousness are assumed to be that original person is monstrous, sir. Monstrous. <laughs> That's no. Dystopia. That's, Stamps. Star Trek represents a utopian society. Humans live in a utopian society. They have everything they need. They have education whenever they want it. They have all the physical possessions they could want. Other than day-to-day -day troubles of just being a sentient creature and having free will, they have an incredible life. There's a utopian society. There's still wars, man. And they're replacing kind of pretty much everything in this whole area. And I don't know how long they've been doing it, but they said they've been planning it for years. <laughs> And I'm like, right. you, yeah. So uh, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm currently blaming for mm. my internet problems. Uh, magic drones do everything needed. People have unlimited free time to do whatever they want, and virtually unlimited resources because of the drones. Everyone just pursues their hobbies and passions. Exactly. That's hodgepodge syntaxia. Now I can tell you why. <clears throat> Nobody has created. Yeah, I know. Sorry about the hiccup, folks. I can tell you why you don't see a lot of settings as utopian settings for gameplay. And it's because they're not very interesting. If we lived in a utopian society, I guarantee you one of the most popular role-playing games would be a dystopian setting. <laughs> so it's not, it's not very exciting to have a utopia. Oh, Zeref Gaming, Wally. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> I like that one a lot. All right. Mm. And then for the robots in that utopian setting, the robots, which had some level, and it's arguable whether the robots were sentient or whether the robots were just very smart computers emulating human emotion and that kind of thing. Well, I mean, if they pass the Turing test, then I guess what of it, you know? Well, because that differentiates between a complete utopia and a dystopia. Oh, if you're if they're enslaving sentient, sentient creatures. If they're actually sentient, then for the robots, it's a dystopia. If they're not actually sentient and they're just, you know, very, very smart gizmos, then it's still a utopia. Actually, I'm going to just take it one step further and I'm going to say it doesn't matter whether or not the robots are sentient. It's what it matters whether or not the humans who don't have passionate things to drive their life get behind the idea that they are sentient and are being enslaved and they must be freed. See, we don't, and we don't know how any of that pans out. I know we're getting into like a really deep philosophical debate <laughs> about Wally now. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to nerdarchy. Uh, <laughs> so I would say that it's actually the humans in that instance, not necessarily whether or not the robots are sentient. It's the humans in that instance deciding whether or not they are willing to destroy what they have to try and free these people that they suspect or, or, or believe mm -hmm. are, are actually being imprisoned and enslaved when they might not be because they actually are just smart computers or not. They're not sentient consciousnesses. Okay. So since we know that a utopia is other than like Star Trek is not as exciting as a dystopia where a hero actually has something to do. Yeah. <laughs> we should probably focus on the dystopian settings. I think we've answered through discussion why dystopian settings are more popular than utopia. 
So I think we should hit on all the elements. I don't think we should limit ourselves to just like Western fantasy. I think we could do sci-fi. I think we could do a superhero setting. I think we could do a modern setting, whatever we want. And if anyone has any suggestions, dystopia is kind of a bag. I can, I can knock something out for you real quick. Out of the bag, and, dystopian. Yeah. And, they, and I can go through my setting, but I would need everyone in chat to agree that you're going to listen to me talk for 20 minutes. And that might get really boring. <laughs> that could be the last half hour. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and people can leave if they wish. <laughs> Uh, is the villain the hero in a utopia? Huh. The utopian people would see him as a villain because they want to preserve their way of life. The dystopian people would see him as a hero because he he's, wanted to change their way of life. Because he's trying to overthrow the order. Mm-hmm. And there's, an, there's another element and in interest, I think, uh, in dystopian things, and that is the idea of disrupting the current hierarchy of a system Mm -hmm. in in the in the mentality is like well zombie apocalypse for example so so a disease destroys most of the world uh, no matter what time frame and you're dealt with dealing with these undead zombies which is okay to kill them because they're not people anymore they're dead things and you're still messed up it's still messed up but you know they will eat you if you don't kill them yes uh so totally that's like self-defense at that point Mm-hmm. against monsters basically so <laughs> fragonator said aren't we here listening to you talk anyway i tell you what we'll just save it for when we hit steampunk when we hit steampunk we'll go through it okay so yeah. you've got this disease that creates this dystopian future mm-hmm. and then i would say that there's always that thought like well i'll still be alive so it'll be great because less competition for resources less competition for xyz thing and, you know, it's not going to be so bad, even though you're going to have to deal with zombies and all that kind of other <laughs> yeah. nonsense. Which are not great. No. But there's always that, you know, it's it's kind of like you could, <clears throat> we could always be better um, bosses than our boss, or we could always be better. The grass is always greener. Yeah. If I ruled the empire, I'd do X. <laughs> yeah. And it would be fantastic. That's how you get a dystopia, by the way. That's one of the yeah. ways. That's a that's a fast track. Take over the empire. Put yourself at the top. <laughs> so that's, I think. No. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was I was just gonna say there's there's loads and loads of ways uh, that I think I think what we should focus on like fifth edition. In a fifth edition classic D and D setting, how do we generate our dystopia? without arguing any of the finer points. Clearly, both of us can go into deep philosophical debates on whether Forgotten Realms is or isn't already a dystopia or utopia. Uh, So I think rather than doing that, we should explore the idea of expressly making it a dystopian setting. Okay. Well, I I say disease is an easy way because there's a few things. Let's say you have a certain level of a decent life for a majority of people simply based on the level of 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 tech whether that's magitech or whatever steampunk whatever you have this certain level but you have to have people who know how to do those things like if you don't if you don't know how to make a windmill to grind to to grind uh, like grains for breads and things like that well mm-hmm. you've got to do it by hand or you've got to spend the time making bad windmills until someone one of you figures out how a good one should have been made and you make the good one so that's a lot of resources developed towards that so now well we had to have all these kids instead of they had to 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 move stuff around instead of sitting there and being the next generation of people that have learned things so that they can learn crafts and trades and skills so when you're Mm -hmm. when you're on that subsistence or like a low level of survivability because of some kind of tragic incident like like a like some kind of disease apocalypse yes the the reduction in people means a reduction in labor specializations and other things you lose a lot of knowledge so that can kind of drop you back down to 
well you know if you're let's say you're you're in the steel age that could drop you down to iron that could drop you down to bronze that could drop you down to i have a sharpened stick mm -hmm. you know like well one of one of the more difficult challenges with turning D, &D into a true dystopia is the prevalence of other races and trying to explain a single event or series of events say a cascading series of events that could somehow quell or squash or diminish everything in the world now we're we're not just saying humans and it's very important when we're talking about fifth edition that we don't just say the reason things are bad is because of uh because of a super plague mm -hmm. because if things are bad because of a super plague then now the dragons are in control or now the elves are in control because most of the humans died but the orcs were fine and they took over all the human areas. So I think it's better to try and focus on a single event or series of events that could have affected the entire planet. Mm -hmm. A disease seems like something in an adventuring party of level 20 players figured out the cure for. Like, the, you know what I mean? Like, what, what kind of event could take place that would shake the foundations of an entire world? So you're saying a handcrafted uh, right. demon god's plague that Some, cannot be magically altered would, would not work for killing off so many, a lot of people? Is that what you're mm, telling me? I'm, I'm just not talking about a cold that got out of hand. I'm talking about like a really nasty, <laughs> like, you breathe the air, and if you die, you turn into a zombie. And if you bite someone, you turn into a zombie. Like that level of bad stuff. Like Any everybody affected. Well, it's the same as, I mean, any sufficiently advanced technology appears to be magic. Uh, so. A asteroid. Uh, like a, like a, a, a natural event that just disrupts the, the entirety of the, of the planet. So like uh, a cataclysmic event, uh, earthquakes that make all the volcanoes everywhere uh, belch fire. So you've got tragedies everywhere. You also have all the issues, the fallout dealing with the damage to all the environments around the world and getting getting cold or hot or whatever XYZ thing you want to have happen. Mm. Okay. <laughs> the sun disappears. <laughs> really powerful parasites, face huggers and chest bursters. Winner! I'm in. No. Um, no really powerful parasites. What about something that changes? Because here's the deal. If you do a worldwide impact event, a super plague made by a god who recovers first because we can kind of play this through historically oh, okay. what, because first you have to pick what period of time are you going to be playing in well i would say is the, the plague happening right now did it happen a thousand years ago all right i would say the oh oh okay i see what you mean you're saying yeah wh did the plague is the plague happening now did it happen yesterday did it happen a year ago? Yeah. Did it happen long a thousand years ago? And we're just dealing with repercussions of that of that plague. Right. Oh, all right. Well, that's that's going to determine what kind of story you want to tell. If you want to just mm -hmm. tell a transformed world, I mean, Dark Sun is a good example of a a group of people decided to change the world to see to mm -hmm. suit their needs. They oppressed others. They destroyed others. And you've got this changing of the world due to them. They're pretty much, they're pretty much like a plague, the a natural disaster. Left. Yeah, the god, <laughs> the gods could no longer be phoned in. You know that kind of yeah. thing. Those are all um, <clears throat> that that's dystopian in that sense that these people are are bringing about a certain world order they see fit, and some things didn't survive. So now, in, the, in this instance, <laughs> a plague could affect some <clears throat> creatures more than others. And a thousand years later, you're dealing with the fallout of there only being like a couple dozen elves living currently. One of the things that I've always found, and chat, I'd love you to weigh in on this. One of the things I've always found is my more popular dystopian settings are ones that are able to generate a convincing status quo. With the zombie apocalypse, everybody knows at some point there won't be any more zombies. Either they're going to rot, they're going to fall apart. 
people are going to figure out to just go live where it's icy because the zombies freeze before they can get to you. Like at some point it comes to an end. So for to some degree, it's less fulfilling. There's a developing. There's a, uh, a pattern that emerges out of the chaos of the apocalypse mm-hmm. or the. So a dystopia that generates a status quo, a fixed new existence is generally speaking the most attractive kind of dystopia. Um, yeah, dystopia the isn't too fast, maybe a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, dwarves would be the first to come back to prominence, I think, due to the industrial, industrious nature and bonus constitution. Um, I would say the primary reason for dwarves to come back to like eminence prominence first is entirely because of their industrious nature. They're close knit, they're family oriented, they all have trade skills. Even a very small group of dwarves could conceivably spawn a new clan and very convincingly set up all the needs to get farming and agriculture and mass production going again they can fabricate their own tools they they spend most of their lives working i would say the easiest group to get back on its feet after something really bad happened would definitely be dwarves now what if there was a magical solution to the problem and people that were naturally more inclined to be wizards or spell casting or sorcerers or whatever they had magic in the blood or they were learned in magic and that was a way for them to kind of counteract that. Then you then you have rather than an industrious race uh, getting out of the situation first, you have more of the people that are more magically inclined. And well, I would even with even with immunity, you're talking about a small percentage of the population having immunity. With dwarves, you're just talking about any dwarf that lives will naturally be inclined to work with any other dwarf that lives and form a community and get things back on track. That's a good point. And their their entire race is based on the concept of community and clans and working together. I think I think dwarves are going to be the easy victor if if the population gets wiped out and there's just a couple of dwarves and a couple of elves. The elves might be like this is it. I guess we're supposed to die off. Meanwhile, I guess, the yeah, dwarves, I guess this is the natural process of the world. We are yeah, no longer supposed dwarves, to exist. The dwarves are not going to give up. They're going to be like, I'm not done. No, let's <laughs> make babies and have more dwarves. Yes, there's still a few of us left. We will continue on. Uh, humans had a bottleneck in our genetics population a long while ago. Another apocalypse having real side effects on our ability to have healthy children. Hmm, that would be interesting. Uh, well, yeah, hodgepodge think- syntaxia, I do not. <laughs> oh, Curtis Stinson said the younger, the most precious and hodgepodge syntaxia said the younger, the most delicious. <laughs> Eat the children. Uh, delicious. Terrible. Um, human farmers would be the least affected. They w- affected, they would be less affected. Uh, a noble who's never plowed a field in their life would have no idea how to get food. Maybe <clears throat> they'd survive through hunting, but they would not be able to deal with long winters to the same level as a farmer. Now, unless they had good leadership skills and they weren't hated by their community. So if you had, a, if you, let's say you're the a noble or a lord or whatever, whatever passes mm-hmm. as a upper echelon beyond the norm for your society, mm-hmm. if you were well liked by enough people and those people also survived, they would probably assist you and take care of you simply because you're probably good at managing you're probably good at you might have the the charisma or the just general like human understanding of gathering people together and organizing them for something mm-hmm. so there's all these kind of like benefits to you being there but at the same time if you were a jerk to enough people they might just they might just get rid of you in the in the new the new way everything um pans out mm-hmm. warforged ta- ai takeover uh- <laughs> I, I think, uh, I, personally, I feel like dwarves would probably be the quickest to recover from some kind of extinction event. Mm-hmm. Uh, dragons would be the slowest to recover. They'd probably be smart, get real low, and hide away until their numbers could return. But dragons are very competitive, so that's a hard that's a hard argument. Maybe they'd be like, awesome, I'm glad I'm the only dragon over here. I'm going to go empty it out all those other hordes. 
<laughs> my brother's dead. I'm going to go take his stuff. Like, he, there's he no would, telling. He would have wanted to leave it with me. He would have wanted to know that these artifacts were well cared for. <laughs> with dystopian settings, one of the questions that always has to be answered is who wouldn't, it's not who would survive, but what group would be the quickest to immediately exploit the weakness in other groups for their own advantage. And this is always this is always something that needs to be addressed in dystopias. Who's going to most quickly jump on available resources or see the weakness in other groups and be like, we can exploit this and I can have more stuff or whatever, more food, more land, whatever it is that person wants. Well, I would think um, more warlike people would have a better it would have an advantage at getting back basically while there's chaos in a structure like you have mm -hmm. a governance or you have a kingdom well the kingdom's only protected as long as there's people to guard the border and the people to guard the border are only there long enough that they are able to be fed or, or pay, slash paid or alive mm -hmm. so if there's yeah. not enough people stretched on all of the tasks that need to be done to run that kingdom and have it not be assailable then it becomes vulnerable, and all you have to have is enough groups of goblin kin or some other kind right. of out out group or um, a group that is not in the kingdom or part of the kingdom can say, hey, that looks nice and tasty. We've always liked their farmland, and we've never been able to get it. Every once in a while, we'll raid to take their sheep and things, but now they could all be ours. <laughs> Exactly. I think, uh, and chat has been hitting this up pretty hard. Goblinoids. Goblinoids would move in very, very quickly to, to take advantage of the deficits left behind. Any goblinoids that survived would probably band together for the sole purpose of eradicating anyone in their way and just being gluttonous. Um, the mind flares would survive from underground, rise from below, and prey on the pathetic, weakened surface dwellers. Hodgepodge Syntaxia, supposedly the mind flares used to rule multiple planets. So the thought is the mind flares might make a bid for power. They had a dystopian future happen to them a while ago. <laughs> and they're, <laughs> they're still alive, which says something. <laughs> They've lost their empire, but they're still alive. Uh, yeah, that oh, that could be really creepy. You just people start disappearing after like um, a terrible incident. And you're like, what is going on? And these creatures that have stayed hidden for a long time because they didn't want to be exposed are now like, well, it's like buffet up here. There's not enough people <laughs> to hurt me. They, so I can just snack on one every once in a while and no one will stop me. So if we're if we're in the process of defining our utopia and we're definitely going with the super plague. Um, I feel like in order to generate an equilibrium where the utopia can self-perpetuate, so you can make, give the player the impression that there will always be a place for heroes. There will always be more to do, more people to save, more things to take care of. I think, uh, the angels and demons uh, okay. You have the heavens and the hells. Uh, once every hundred years or whatever, have a war. Okay. And the outcome of the war determines uh, who's in charge, basically. And the heavens have been in charge since the beginning of time. So okay. the demons finally figured out something to do to make the war spill onto the mortal plane. And the war is eternal. The war is never ended. They're always fighting in every hundred years. Essentially, the the last of the demons is killed off and the, the, the heavens get to... Tallied. Right, and the score is tallied and the heavens win and we all go on living happy sunny days. What if you had something where there were either the war is spilled into the prime material plane or the prime material plane simply has rifts being torn in it at random or a massive number of rifts, like known rifts, or maybe demons just have uh, much freer access to the prime material plane. Uh, this makes it so like little outlying villages and stuff like that, they just can't exist. When you have a, 
a 15 foot long, 12 feet at the shoulder demon hound creature barreling along the countryside, you can't have a small village with farmers. So you generate this, this, uh, and hint, this is kind of stealing from my own setting. You can't have, <laughs> you can't have uh, many of the things that people take for granted. So you end up with these very rigid, strict survivalist communities coming together. For the good of the community, we have this rule so that we all live and survive. For the good of the community, we have X, Y, Z thing uh, that we must Rain obey and, and follow. Hmm. Right. Rain, rain of fire and rain of fire. Uh, they they've all managed to hole up in a castle. Uh, they dig areas that they can hide in in case there's a dragon attack. They try and make sure the dragons don't see them. Uh, they're very rigid about when food can be harvested. So, you know, if you were to show up in a community like that as a player and be like, hey, I have tons of food to sell, you'd make a killing. And that's <laughs> the kind of thing, you know what I mean? And that's that's the kind of like little implied gameplay elements that make those kinds of settings more attractive. Scarcity of resources that would typically be available in Dark Sun, they did it with iron. There was like they were like there's like no steel. They you can use bone. They stacked up the dystopian elements in, in Dark Sun. It's like scarcity, terrible people, tyrannically living, you know, ruling over everybody. Oh yeah, like half the races you love are gone. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some of the ones you didn't like are gone, too. Uh, Vicky T said, halflings are, are, again, small, so need less food in a dystopia. They don't need less food if tokens to be believed. Uh, <laughs> well, there's a difference uh, between having to eat to survive a certain amount and wanting to eat a certain amount. Mm, uh, James Ozzy, you can have a small village with farmers that just... Just don't name the town Ziploc. I'm not Potato pe- family and the half of the button down. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, question. Would the creation of a sanctuary spell that affects an entire city be an automatic utopia? It's it, an interesting it question. It would if you didn't have to fuel the spell's ritual power with people. The sanctuary spell's made with people. Yeah. Yeah, so it would be, in, in a lot of ways, because they would they wouldn't have to work worry about outside influences or attacks. Um, maybe if you could now, okay, so you could take that concept and be like, look, it's all happy sunshine and clouds and rainbows, but then you say, well, you can't leave because you disrupt the spell. Then, mm. so you actually can't leave the sanctuary now. So you're trapped. You're gener- for generations. You're trapped within the sanctuary spell. Or you Somebody risk, leaving. Well, yes, which would destroy something. <laughs> so guess yeah. what? If someone has an idea that you're going to leave, you might be put on the bad list and you might disappear. Yeah, exactly. Or would it'd you, be imprisoned. I would say more more likely be imprisoned. Uh, about the hound wandering around eating people. Oh, okay. All right, James Leslie, I gotcha. Well, I would, I would gotcha. say imprisoned seems like it would work, but we aren't saying that these people are super uber peaceful now just simply because they have the sanctuary spell. So imagine I say to you, Hey, we're safe from all the war everywhere. As long as none of us leave, we'll be fine. We like, we don't have to deal with that threat. All right. Well, that sounds great. Well then Joe over there wants to leave and he'll disrupt the spell and then we can be attacked. So basically the people that have to fight the wars then will be dead because of Joe. So I think Joe's got to go like, Never be seen again. Mm-hmm. Disappear in a black van. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, and and that sounds terrible. And I would never, ever, ever want to be put in a position to make that decision. But what I'm saying is, as soon as you start thinking about the greater good, the individual kind of loses, loses a bit of oomph and relevancy. Like, when you start saying, like, on the millions of people... So that, and that's like the moral issue there at that point. And that's where you can have that story again. Like each one of these, each, each kind of, each one of these like is a hiccup in a story that you can, that you can stick party members into. You can stick player characters and tell stories in those little like bumps in the road of 
this kind of what well sounds like a great thing a sanctuary spell that's you know protects everybody in the city great but you put a little few hiccups or disturbances or you know the fly in the ointment concept and then you've got this interesting way of telling a story about a, a about a place i i did a semi utopian uh, zerift uh oh he's skipping my comments again we don't do any real world discussions of religion politics race none of that we want to talk about D, &D. so if i skip your comment it's because i don't want to talk about it um so a, a D, D setting is if you wanted to make it so that playing through the transition to dystopia you could have your players try and prevent some horrible thing from happening force them to fail which it would involve you could make it involve the tiniest amount of railroading just the tiniest little oh you just weren't on time just and then forcing them to play as a dystopian world emerges um so that could be a really fun thing and then you don't you don't have to flesh out a thousand years down the road you can literally do this is what it looks like as it takes place there's there's um, a whole bunch of fires started everywhere what are we going to do yeah. kind of thing and as at the end you're like <laughs> you're leading them through this chaotic time and that can be kind of excited exciting and fast pace and it can also be they're like it's almost like the ship is sinking and you're the the players characters are all trying to plug the holes and then they right. realize that like they're going to drown if they stay down here trying to plug these holes so the place goes south basically and then you're stuck with all these uh with churning through all the chaos that happens from that uh oh, well if i misunderstood zerif that's my fault sorry about that um, I will say that when I let the players run through the you're now in a dystopian setting and you start dealing with it and seeing things go poorly all around you, uh, I will say that uh, I did end up having a player feel really dejected about the entire thing because they felt like the point of them being there was to be a hero and they didn't get to do anything they didn't feel like their heroic actions made a difference because things were just getting worse. Um, <laughs> so when you're in the middle of everything falling apart, it can definitely be disconcerting, especially when the whole goal of you, your character might be to be heroic, to save lives, to do the right thing. And then around you, no matter how much good you do, things are still falling apart. And at that, at that point, if, if you like for storyline purposes, if you still want to go that route, I would say make sure that you definitely draw attention to the minor successes that they have or the major successes that are still there. They're just got a little bit of grime on them from all the other crazy <laughs> stuff happening. Uh, I would definitely include those like mark those points in the player characters and, and, the, and the players minds as well. So they're kind of like. You know, we're still we're still succeeding. It's just we're struggling against a really strong tide when it when it comes to, you know, the storyline and what's going on overall arc, story arc wise. So, I mean, every every like minor success is great in a, in a place like that. And it's definitely give them a little bit of time to kind of celebrate that. There's a reason that most movies end on a good note. <laughs> so so <laughs> keep, spell keep that in mind. It's a it's like. You know, pretty Our spell straightforward. Jammer campaign. When I thought we were going to have to kill that guy that had just hosted us the day before and filled our bellies and was super nice to us, I was like, "Oh, thank God we didn't have to kill him." Oh man, I'm so glad I didn't have to kill that guy. Like he, he let me save him. He let me keep him alive. I was really worried that we we're going to have to take him out, and I really didn't want to. I was like, clearly this guy's just messed up. We can sort him out. We can make this better for him. So yeah have them be at level 20 force the fail everyone knows they were heroes who failed and the event strips them back to level one demoralized party <laughs> <laughs> they were already upset with me when things went south this was a shadow run campaign i'm basically the big bad guy who was named fitzroy uh the big bad guy Neil basically fitzroy. accomplished yeah accomplished his goal uh, and destroyed this arcology, which 
which had literally millions of people living in it. So everyone in the arcology is dead. The arcology is like the center of this city. Uh, and if you're a Shadowrun player, it's the Renraku arcology. Uh, but the, the arcology is at the center they, of the city. They destroyed an arcology? Yikes. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. Yeah. With like, yeah, with like 15 million people living in it. It's at the center of the city. And so now the this area is quarantined and people can't go anywhere near it. And what destroyed the arcology is spreading to the rest of the city. Wow. And the players are just incredibly demoralized and trying to deal with all of this. And they ended up like really, realistically speaking, the shadow runners, which is a job about committing crimes, the shadow runners ended up being very, very similar to like Batman. Like they were <laughs> heroic. They were always showing up with new gadgets. They were always trying to save the day. Like that's all they ended up doing until that campaign ended was being heroic. So, yeah. So Curtis, I thought you were going with the, they started at level 20 as a story element. And they all know they were going to something bad was going to happen to them that was going to just basically drop them, in some way, energy drain, some kind of crazy magical thing that they barely survive and they happen to be at level a one. A piece of your soul is gone. Yes, a really big chunk is missing. Uh, so you're level one. Uh, those kind of things are cool because that would be kind of like you felt you fell in a really deep pit and you're trying to climb back out. So you, every mm -hmm. like. Every every experience is technically new and old at the same time, because you're regaining those levels. But you also your character has those memories of already having done spectacular things that they mm -hmm. can't. So it's kind of like everybody. I could see th several of the players taking different angles with their character. One it, one's like totally into it. It's like I'm just gonna redo my life. This is gonna be fantastic. And another one's like just totally depressed all of the time about what they were, the greatness that they were. The fact that they failed and that they lost everything because of that. There is a complex disconnect there. You mean I know how to spoke, speak these languages and then I forgot? <laughs> well, most of the time you're not going to gain too many languages from 20th level. Or skills but... or spells or there is, it's complicated. I forgot how to use a shield as well. It would be more like a memory wipe. Well, I mean, if it was a magical like thing that stripped you of combat effectiveness as in hit points. I mean, uh, we have no real world context for losing a chunk of your soul. So maybe that's a perfect answer. <laughs> oh, I know a really good way. Magic. Explain it like that. <laughs> it, was yeah, it was magic. It was magic. It was magic. There was uh, spells and magic stuff happened. I don't know what to tell you. It was, uh, it was like sparkles in the air. Now you can't, you can't do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for, forevermore. Pixies. Yeah. I think it was pixies. <laughs> I hate sparkles. <sighs> yeah. Unicorns, so, pixies, and rainbows, my enemy. Uh, if they went back to level one, would they still retain their ability score improvements? I really think one of the best things to do in dystopian settings is the offer of power with a cost. Man, does that. Players love power with a cost. I did a system where you had all these different mutations that I stole from because Gamma World and AD and D Second Ed creatively were compatible. repurposed. I think is what you meant to say. Yes, creatively they were compatible for a while, and so yeah, so I creatively repurposed all of the mutations in Gamma World to be abilities you could get by abusing this drug, and the drug would make you permanently lose constitution and get a random mutation, completely random mutation. And people dove in. People That's dove like, in head first. It's like the deck of many things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Except Wait. minus the wishes and the, the, the total awesome. We had, we had a person with a scorpion tail and a carapace. Uh, we had awesome. people with like telepathic powers. We had crazy, crazy really stuff. Crazy cool. stuff. Yeah, I could see some whittling away themselves to uh, to have all those boosts. <laughs> all the dark yeah. packs for the Dark Lords of Ravenloft. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's supplying players with some motivation to make them feel like a dystopia is okay. In my setting, the way I make you feel like a dystopia is okay is you literally are the biggest, meanest thing that's ever walked the earth. 
you're there's a group of people that survived and ended up better than before the dystopian events took place and now you're one of those people that's better off so uh hodgepods the deck of many things should be the cause of the dystopia <laughs> it could very well be wishes gone awry from people who should not be meddling in wishes yeah seriously and uh yeah james leslie after today you're done with scorpion things whatever <laughs> do you mean <laughs> james scorpion was playing are... james was playing in my um in my uh uh, fan game today so I, mm. need, I needed an extra an extra dice roller and he was right there for me awesome now i put that in discord i don't run the campaigns i mean i don't run the fan games all the time it's i take a it's like every three every three months i run one and if i don't get any replies or if i don't get enough replies i will put them a request for players somewhere on the internet you know, be one of our social media things. So. Somewhere on the internet. Sometimes it's Patreon. Sometimes it's Company of the Nag over on Facebook. Sometimes it is Discord. So, well, I would say Discord would be a pretty easy way to find people right now. There's like 200 people online. Yeah. It, so. it, in fact, it was. I had a response. Practically, I saw. I swear, he t started typing before I blinked a couple <laughs> times and looked back to see if anybody responded. Me, 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 me. <laughs> I saw it being typed. I'm like, oh. Well. I guess I got somebody. <laughs> I'm already okay, getting reply. Uh, superhero dystopian. Okay, so superhero dystopian, are we talking there's one person or there's a few? All right, well, I would say... You... I need a group of players to be involved in this world you're making. Okay, Where so... Where do they fit in? I would, I, would, I would like them to be... have some kind of power. And maybe someone who's a little over the top has messed up the world or created a weird, crazy police state <laughs> that is all kinds of tyrannical because they know the right way to live and they want to show everybody and they'll enforce it with laser beam eyes if they if you don't live their way. Then, <laughs> Injustice, Aaron Parks. Yes. So you've got you've got these uh, group of players that are kind of median level. Maybe they for some reason, picked up a strange route. Whatever reason that you want to give that they're, they've they become superheroes in a way, they have uh, extraordinary power beyond normal. And they're nothing... X-Factor. Yeah, X-Factor. Uh, Teenagers like, started to, at puberty, started to show mutant abilities in this generation. Yeah, so that's, that's a Done. good that's a good example. So I would, I would start off the player characters like that because they can, they know that maybe eventually they'll be able to challenge that, that, uh, tyrant but as of right now they can only kind of like write the injustices that they see at the time or that they get involved mm -hmm. with so they it's kind of like player driven and player character story driven on what they want to deal with at the time and that maybe eventually the whole point is to overthrow the rule of the person so i played marvel superheroes endlessly when i was a little kid and my favorite kind of character was a character who gets all of their abilities based on technology. Now you can have some higher stats, but most of your abilities come from pieces of technology or just being very smart. So Iron Man is really is really what that is based off of, the Iron Man style character. So in my setting, I didn't want to play in the Marvel superhero setting. It's all I had played for years. So I made a Marvel setting that was they're mutants but mutants are kind of like the old storybook vampire if i bite you and turn you into a vampire you instantly somehow turn quote evil okay whatever that means right so, so the mutants superheroes. bit people and then they became vampires well that, no I just the mutants things. You just mix things. Mutants <laughs> are just inherently bad. Most of them have very little intelligence and are just like, think of Rhino, the supervillain. But Rhino is just pure evil. And I mean, Rhino from the comics, not powered armor Rhino. Um, although I guess there technically was a suit on the Rhino. But anyway, the point is a fleshy, creepy, quasi-Resident evil -y version of the Rhino. Okay. That's what all of the heroic abilities turned into. And the players were essentially stuck in this position of guns and gadgets and technology to try and defeat bad guys. Um, Which are all so, these super pumped up 
abnormalities. Right. So the abnormalities became the evil thing. And then every once in a while, one of the abnormal people would be incredibly powerful and end up ending in a, being in a position of power. So most of the world's governments and most of the world was starting to be run by these mutants. It'd be kind of like if Magneto took over and he was like twice as immoral as he currently is, like way more immoral than he currently is. Like mutants are the best and let's just murder most of the humans. Okay. If they don't work for us, they're dead. Um, and then your players take this position of trying to trying to fight, trying to free people. You're essentially part of a rebel alliance. I like that. So we've done superheroes mm. and super and super uh, diseases. Yeah. Warlord, super mutants. Face rip. Gadgeteer. Gadgeteer is the name for someone with lots of equipment in the original DC Universe role-playing game. Um in the DC Universe role-playing game, which was also a pretty good role-playing game, uh, but not a great rule system. Uh, it was Gadgeteers. Batman was a Gadgeteer. You're a, and super, so Joker. You're a superhuman nerd right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, what, I what love page Superman. number was that? <laughs> uh, no, that's really cool. I think that's really cool that you were into it enough that you knew that stuff. I'm just messing with you. A third of the way through the book, because that's standard practice, character generation in the front. Hmm. <laughs> Going on your knowledge of books, uh, character yeah. books in general. Most uh, RPG books, mm -hmm. character generation in the front. Makes sense. That's what everybody wants. You want to be like, what can I do? What can yeah. I make? Who will I be? You don't care about all the other stuff you, until you, later. You've said hi. You've said kind of what the point of this book is. Now give me my character creator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. So uh, did we do Mega Disaster yet? Mega Disaster. Like Comet we did a Plague, but meh. Meh. So no Super Earth. I okay. prefer... So do you... So would would you... To be interested, you'd have to have Rift's level of a Mega Disaster? We don't, we don't need Rift's level Mega Disaster. Uh, you could definitely do something like... Um, if a Super Volcano exploded right now things would get real dark and real cold mm -hmm. for a long time, like 20 years. Long enough That's a long time. To be bad. Long enough to be bad for what's currently, how everything runs. A, a super volcano blowing up in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons would cause sweeping changes across the planet. Mm -hmm. And if the players existed during that period of time, they would probably think that somebody cursed the world. Yes. But it wouldn't be a curse. Yes. It would some, literally be a volcano exploding. Well, some some god's mountain blew up. And maybe it's because he fought with another god. And then so you could like basically it would be, it would also be made like religious changes and other things would occur due to how they developed the storyline of what happened. So regardless of if it was just a super volcano and you know, the, the god really wasn't there. He was someplace else. That was just, they thought he lived there and he didn't. Um, mm. he, I mean, he maybe he was summering in some kind of tropical island volcano at the <laughs> time when it blew up, so he wasn't around. So he's not actually dead. It's just enough people yeah. believe him to be dead that he might as well have just, like, thrown half of his power away. So anyway, mm -hmm. there could have been, like, some fight of deities as far as the people were concerned when it was really just a natural explosion of this, of the super volcano. And then from there, you're going to have alterations and cults form you're going to have uh you know you're going to have religious kind of turned not twisted or or like bent but like more of like just a turning of philosophy that may develop some kind of less uh, less beneficial to to society you know based on i mean imagine what i well i was just i just remembered a storyline but i can't remember where it's from I can tell you guys the storyline, but I cannot tell you where it's from because I don't remember. Basically, you have a pantheon of gods that rule the world, and they're petty, and they're mean, and they do horrible crap to humanity all the time. And so this hero emerges called the God Slayer, and the God Slayer goes and kills the petty gods. But 
he does so very quickly. The God Slayer kills like like 15 gods or something in the course of three days. <sighs> Basically, he makes it to the heavens with this weapon that the trickster god created for him and goes through and just kills all the all the gods. He must but wake up very early in the morning. <laughs> yeah. When he returns to the mortal world, the something like maybe it was God of War. I'll tell you how the story pans out. Maybe you'll tell me if that's what it was. So he kills all the gods, but the problem is every time he kills a god, there's repercussions. So like, for instance, the first god I think he killed was like the god of the hunt. He kills the god of the hunt and almost all of the wild animals in the world die. That's a big he deal. Kills, yeah. He kills the god of storms or something and the clouds are gone and the earth is just baked in the sun all the time. He kills... Um, I think I would have stopped killing petty gods at this point. <laughs> well, he didn't know. Oh, he, he was he was heaven. He was not there. Okay. Right. He was in the heavens killing off the, the gods. And then he killed the god of gods, who's the one who created everything. And so there's like earthquakes and typhoons and all this other stuff that takes place. So when he comes back down to the mortal world, the mortal world is just trashed. And they probably anybody that met him and found out he did this is probably like, you're a bad guy. You're a bad person. You've destroyed right. he, everything. He comes back thinking that he's going to be heralded as a hero because he's killed all these gods. And when he comes back, the mortal world is com in complete chaos. Almost all of humanity has been wiped out. So, but I can't remember. That's not my story. That's someone else's story. And I cannot remember where I read that. I but, can't yeah. remember I if I've read it before or heard of it or watched it. Mm. So. Maybe someone will know. Dying gods return to Earth as fallen angels. Fun idea. Aaron Parks, question. What do you think of massive contagious illusion being the cause of a catastrophe? Like instead of a real disease, it is all illusion that spreads like a plague to those that disbelieve. So are you talking like madness? Like kind of in a type of an uh, insanity or, or, or not understanding what real reality is, what like reality is anymore? Like that kind of thing. That would suck. Like hallucination. No, no thanks. That's horrible. <laughs> it's, be... I know it's dystopian, but that's that's gruesome. Yeah. Well, I, well, I always look for. Okay, so how could you have people have fun in that game, striving against those problems? So you'd have to have the player characters have some way of being resistant or some way of disrupting that problem. Maybe they. Maybe they've all figured out a certain particular weird charm or they're, they all started as people who were around a certain thing or had a disease when they were young and they no longer are affected by certain elements within the world and one of those is this weird, crazy uh, madness plague. Mm -hmm. um, like, you, I would, you gotta give them, gotta give them a little bit of reprie re uh, reprieve from the stuff because because they're, they're gonna have to deal with a crazy messed up world, so they can't be crazy and messed up completely in that world as well, or they don't have any like, or no. use history to wipe the slate clean. Uh, in my own setting, it's only been like fifty years since things went south, but you could you could use history to kind of wipe the slate clean and say. 200 years later, nobody's affected anymore, but the world is messed up as a result of what these people did. What about wild magic? I mean, wild magic has the potential to create a dystopia literally on its own. Yes, wild magic. Burning down inns <laughs> since inception. Yes. <laughs> oh, um... I watched a animated short about uh, how a person ended the world with karaoke. And um, she was a wild mage. And in the end, a terrible catastrophe was let loose because of strange wild magic powers. So um, it has happened in people's games. So why not have the storyline start that way? <laughs> well, you could, you could have any number of events be the trigger for a series of bad events or a major catastrophic event. And I think anyone running a campaign who gets their characters to 11th or 12th level 
11th or 12th level, if you've been running the same group of players that long, that's quite a feat. Like, congratulations, kudos to you as a GM for sticking with it that long because it's very hard to get players that, that high level. Um, typically, by the time people hit 15th level, they absolutely hate their characters and want to roll new ones. <laughs> You're like, that's we want to play something different? Thank you. Yeah, I'm done being this person new, please. Um, but... I think uh, if you manage to get players that, that high level, you could definitely sauce things up with dystopia. And I, for me, I just start implementing weird stuff like drugs that give you random mutations and like, hey, you want to reinvent your character? Take some of this. <laughs> it's good for you. Come on, everyone's doing it. And then, you Here's know, five it. rolls later, I need new character. <laughs> My character's all messed up. Here's a red potion bottle. Here's a blue one. Yeah, what would you like I'm, to a, eat? I'm a pain in the butt with that kind of stuff, though, because I tell people, I'm like, look, you're all level 12. If you guys do this and want to remake new characters because you don't like the result, you're starting at level one. <sighs> <laughs> Decide now before any dice get rolled. They're like, no, thanks. I'm good. They, still did it. they didn't care. They did not care. That well, was not. Because you're persuasive saying, at all. You're saying at that point they kind of wanted to play a different game, and you gave them the mm -hmm. opportunity, said, "Hey, we could play a different game like this." Yeah, exactly, exactly. So every single person getting wild magic, yeah, that would be that would be a new era of chaos, as far as I'm concerned. That you know, what are you supposed to do with that? Someone could just be doing mage hand because they're lazy and start a bar fire, mm -hmm. or turn you into a potted plant, and then a horse steps on you. And then you turn back into a person that's been stepped by on by a horse and you're dead. <laughs> I hit 26 in second ed AD and D. Uh, then the party started to turn as I slowly became a vampire. Apparently a vampire necromancer makes people nervous. It makes me nervous. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a little dis disconcerted. <laughs> Am I a food group to you? <laughs> or only food group or a pack animal after i die or mysteriously exactly. catch a cold and die yeah exactly are you gonna make me a zombie just tell me the truth now i just need to know <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so uh should i do you guys want me to run through a very abridged version of my dystopian setting. I can try and make this as quick as possible. Oh, real quick, answer the question for DM Don. Question, stat bumper feet? Almost always feet. Unless I really need to get that 20 in a stat. Almost always feet. Instead of Is stat my bump. stat even or odd? Ooh, that's also a good question. <laughs> yeah, so if the stat is odd, yeah, probably a feat that's going to give it a bump plus do cool things like Tavern Brawler or something cool like that. Yeah. Resilience. But yeah, okay. mostly feats. Okay. Um, I haven't done this in a while, so forgive me if I'm bumbling. Uh, okay, so dystopian setting. Okay, yes. are you going to just roll on this? Can I take a little quick I'm, break? I'll be right back. If you need to step away for two minutes, I'm going to try and go really quick. This okay. is going to be the two version. minutes. Okay. Okay, I'm so lonely. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, all right, so we're going to start in 1775, the year 1775 in the real world. Uh, James Watt patents the first steam engine. In the following years, the technology is quickly adopted and used for textiles, ironworks, and a host of other applications. So we're saying steam engine, patent 1775, uh, 1783. Uh, just between Rwanda and the Congo, an English explorer discovers the first of the trees of life, believing the tree to be the tree of knowledge from the Garden of Eden. The explorer pr approaches unafraid. Uh, with the naivety of a child, the great tree shares with this man the secrets of the ages and the revelations of immortality. Explorer James Nodding spreads, spends the next four years of his life in study of the great tree before returning home. Uh, so the, the storyline, and I, could, I can read it chunk by chunk, but I'm pretty sure you guys don't want that. Uh, so the storyline continues to move forward. And basically what happens is uh, James, the explorer returns to England and shares with the Royal Naturalist Society everything he's discovered from the Tree of Life. Uh, the Vatican finds out about him supposedly finding the Tree of Knowledge from the Garden of Eden, Eden 
and shows up immediately to squelch any idea that this could possibly have happened. Um, James Nodding is forced to sign a confession and supposedly commits suicide. And the confession is that he made up the story. Uh, another one of his contemporaries refuses to accept that James Nodding would have committed suicide and decides to take up a bunch of the notes and journals of James Nodding from his four years of study of the tree and go exploring in Africa and try and figure out where the tree was and continue to study it. Um, immediately, uh, immediately, so 1800, we're all the way up to 1800 now, immediately after the election of Pope Pius VI, no, seventh, the Vatican launches a crusade to destroy the Tree of Life, because now, at this point, the Vatican knows where the tree is. Uh, they consider it an abomination in the eyes of God. Many of the explorers that had gone to study the tree are slaughtered alongside the tree. Uh, and a single man who left just days before this, this attack manages to take a sample of the tree of life with him, uh, and he escapes uh, to America in order to uh, try and beat being pursued anymore. Um in 1805, amidst a myriad of tests, a sample of the Tree of Life is used as fuel. The fires created from the body of the Tree of Life burn like the sun and seem to have no limit to them. The small sample Albert ignites burns continuously for days before finally expending itself. Though not an inventor or engineer by trade, Albert realizes the potential of his discovery using a further sample to showcase it. Uh, and he so he secures a bunch of investors, a bunch of people put money into it. Uh, at the same time all this is happening, 1807, uh, cataloged amongst a thousand such forbidden texts, one of the many diaries of James Notting, the original explorer, becomes the obsession of Vatican librarian Dante De Luca. Knowledge gathered from the Tree of Life permeates the pages of the document. Basically, Dante De Luca finds this document that talks about magic, and he's so worried that somebody's going to figure out that he has it or that he keeps sneaking off to read it that he takes the book and flees to, to England with um, He refuses to let knowledge of the occult die with him because he's already an old man when he found the book. Knowing that he's gonna die, he pens the book Nimus Vita uh, and then starts trying to circulate the book. Uh, a occult book collector finds out about the book, realizes what it actually is, and starts spreading it around. And soon uh, a cult is formed in the underbelly of London uh, called the College of Nimus Vita, which is people who are actually practicing magic. Um, 1811, in 1811, Albert Huron patents Huron steel, a metal made from forges using the Tree of Life as fuel. Uh, which would allow you to do lots of real world things like make things out of titanium and stuff like that. Um, Huron is able to identify and harvest other trees of life. So now he's going out and actively killing off the trees of life uh, in order to use them as fuel. Uh, and the fuel is originally used for what's called the Huron engine, a steam engine that's more powerful than anything they've ever had access to. Uh, yeah, London and many nearby townships enjoy the privilege of modern convenience. 1822, magically, magic, openly practiced in both France and the Americas, is accepted as a form of science. The Royal College of the Occult is moved into the public eye. The conglomeration of science and the science of magic have staggering effects on mankind. Innovation moves faster than man can adapt. Uh, 1838, in distant North America, a single tree of life, eldest amongst its kind, endows its soul to the beasts of the wood. The result of this legacy are the Animus Bellum, massive intelligent beasts, think Princess Mononoke wolves, that speak as men. These mighty beasts wage war on the harvesters and successfully stem man's wanton plunder of the remaining trees of life. Uh, 1840, Sioux Indians led by a beast of the wood named Streamrunner, uh, forever changed the borders of Western America. The Great Indian War lasts nearly three years and only abates after the armistice of 1843. And you will notice if you know your history that some of these events are events that actually happened that I modified. They happened at the right time, but I just modified them to fit my storyline. Uh, though the war never truly ends, 
open conflict cease with only minor territorial disputes disputes taking place in later years. The Western United States becomes the Sioux Nation. America, the first nation to do so, openly recognizes the beasts of the wood as persons or creatures of intelligence of intelligence and self-awareness. Though they have no rights in the American states, they cannot be slain, hunted, enslaved, or otherwise treated as an animal, animal under law. Uh, 1851, and this is when things start to get a little crazy. The great exhibition of the works of magic and industry, the first World's Fair, is held in London. Nations from across the globe come together to exhibit, in exhibit, of the most advanced clockwork and arcane, the first magic powered steam engine, as well as medical miracles worked through the science of magic, steal the spotlight and garner international attention. Uh, 1854, uh, England becomes heavily involved in the Crimean War. Uh, just as great strides are made in the study of magic as a weapon, Florence Nightingale advances the study of magic as a tool for medicine. Uh, 1899, the Boer War in South Africa splits England into anti and pro-war parties. The war quickly becomes a breeding pit for anti-magic propaganda, and four senior mem members of the Royal College of the Occult are burned in the streets. Um, so these, these kinds of like little events keep taking pla place. 1914, anybody who's up on the history knows what 1914 is. Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the Austria-Hungary throne, is assassinated. The Archduke's assassination at the hands of a Yugoslav occultist becomes the focal point of worldwide attention. Alliances spanning the globe are invoked. Nearly every major power in the world becomes involved in what is known as the World War. And then we start with Prometheus Year One, and there's only a few of these. We're almost done. I'm trying to go as quick as I can. I knew and you were going to be longer than two minutes. I've been I've been cutting chunks out. I've been cutting big chunks out and not reading whole whole entries. Uh, even with technological and magical innovations, the trenches of the war become ripe with the dead and dying. Lasting longer than anyone predicted, the Americans fear the war could drag on for many years. America enters the war with a final solution. Long in development for use against the Sioux Nation, America now readies its super weapon Prometheus for use against a new target. Under British supervision, America secretly deploys the Prometheus plug into German trenches. The magic-born disease consumes everything. Unable to tell friend from foe, the weapon strikes back at its master, transforming a five-mile stretch of trench works into a mass grave. Um, the world war ends, the whole world becomes infected, the oceans evaporate into seas of salt, uh, the wilderness areas become great fields of ash. Uh, Prometheus basically feel, feeds on life in all forms. Uh, Prometheus year 10, mankind is reduced from over 1 billion to fewer than 5 million souls worldwide. And back then our population was actually only around 1 billion people. We're at almost 7 now, seven. something like that. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, what little survives the Holocaust endures great ash storms reminiscent of desert sandstorms. Plants and animals across the globe are ill-suited to the wasteland, and many survivors of Prometheus die of starvation. The few able to survive both plague and famine live through the horrors of desperation as men become murderers for a drink of clean water. Uh, Prometheus 15, uh, the world starts to uh, emerge from the void. Uh, Prometheus year 30, Mary Fitzroy arrives in what is now New London at the head of 200 Wastelanders. She basically slaughters everyone in the city and establishes it as, uh, the new, as New London. She, it, it's the time that she came to the city and killed everyone is still referred to the cleansing of London. Uh, ten years after Mary Fitzroy's rise to Monarch, New London continues its slow crawl across the landscape. As the city expands, so too does its demand for all form of textiles, foodstuffs, and a host of other modern conveniences. Marauders plague small farming villages and outlying communities. Mary begins her appointment of barons to control the outer territories. And basically, this is where it starts up. Your players in this game start with a group of five characters, which is called a knight's congregate. It's what the knights of Ex the round table were there. There's a technical term for them, the knight's congregate. So the knights arrive as a knight's, con the players play a knight's congregate and uh, 
are barons for Mary Fitzroy. But there you go. There you go. So there's your your crazy dystopian walk. Yeah, and you just changed, you tweaked a few things throughout a 100-year, 150-year uh, timeline, and then right. just kind of where it led from there. But you know what? I heard magical plague that killed everybody in there somewhere. So super disease? <laughs> well, it's much easier when everyone's a human and there's no such thing as dragons. Okay, this, I, <laughs> that's true. This is true. It's, this is true. Yeah, there's no, there's no weirdness that could possibly survive a super plague, so... Now, in your in your world, there is still that last forest of the uh, the people, though, right? The the beasts so they survive the, beasts the Prometheus, the, right? Right. The beasts of the wood have what are called heart trees. Basically, you can kill a beast of the wood's physical form, but it will return to life from the tree which it's bound to. So, in most beasts of the wood, they'll they'll like um, I wrote a short story where one beast of the wood goes into this huge desolate area it lays down it contemplates its life it accepts death and when it dies a tree grows out of that and so the tree that grows out of that spawns the creature back into existence it lives again they're really in truth like an actual force of nature mm. so but so animal spirits bound to trees what do you think about that James, <laughs> Leslie? bound to trees they are trees oh all right hmm uh, I said this ages ago when we were talking about settings. If you run that setting online, I'd like to play in it. I it sounds like a great Mage the Ascension story world. It sounds like a great alt history tale. It's it's I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's it's supposed to be a setting for a tabletop miniature skirmish game that I was under contract for. So there you go. You play a nice congregate. You have miniature skirmishes with it. Mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of fluff for a game that revolves around beating the hoo-hoo out of each other. <laughs> a group of like five to ten miniatures. So. Dice and minis. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I would say that um, that could easily get adapted to something more along the lines of like 5e style where you're playing an individual mm -hmm. character. You're Well, in this case, you could all be part of this knight's congregate. You wouldn't have to be. If you wanted or to you make it be, 5e. Or you could be other stuff. You could be a Prometheus born, which is someone who lived through Prometheus and they were mutated by it. And so now they're nine feet tall or have tentacles instead of arms or whatever. Mongrelman. Yeah. You could have, you could have, uh, what's it called? Flesh forging, which is like the steampunk version of cybernetics. Hmm. Yeah. And there are rules for all that in the game setting. We should, we should just, we should just fifth edition all of it and be like, okay, we took all of fifth edition, we threw it away, and this is the game you're playing with fifth edition rules. Campaign setting, done. <laughs> it's pretty much just a, it needs to be um, converted in a sense. Burning trees of life creates a backlash Ravenloft mist effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just sounds bad. Oh yeah, that bur this burns for a long time. That's nice. You're going to d d die <laughs> a terrible death from burning a tree of life. James Leslie said mildly different. They come from the trees, not imprisoned in the trees, Nate. <laughs> mm. Well, the tree did appear as the, mm -hmm. the spirit. So what came first, the tree or the... Yeah. Okay, so my point in sharing all that is I did use a magical plague, but I yeah. had an easy out. Everybody's human. Mm -hmm. There are no... Okay, all right. I don't I have to say it affects Umber Hulks. You right? have the convenience of killing everybody when they were as humans. And now, because the Prometheus born, you could technically have elves be a mutation. Sure. You can do anything speaking. you want. It. There's The Prometheus plague is still out there. That's how the world perpetuates. Mm. Is the Prometheus plague never went away. They're just little areas of life, little patches of grassland, little chunks of forests that have managed to survive. And that's what people congregate around. So the poor bugger wanting to reform it, you s <laughs> stuffed in a tree came first. You try and do a good thing for a guy, keep him out of the fires of uh, eternal torment, and everybody no. hates on you about it. <laughs> Who are you to second guess the gods? Actually, I think in a fantasy setting, you should always second guess the gods. Yeah, they're probably doing something bad or they're, turning they're into a bull and doing something bad. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or Nasty goose or monkey. dust or whatever the heck he was doing. Or goose or dust. I don't know. Goody whatever Zeus dust. has been up to. He checks mm -hmm. all the boxes for a naughty god. Oh, uh, Cardboard Fortress, you missed my setting read through. Yeah, you'll have to do a little backtracking. It wasn't super exciting. I thought it was. But I'm good. not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're winding down, not not yeah. continuing on. Yeah, never again. So, final questions, and uh, we're going to mm. do a little recap. So, we talked about dystopian and utopian settings. How to Utopia kinda... is boring, dystopia is dope. Yeah, unless you play <laughs> the few people that fall through the system, and it's actually dystopia for you, but everyone else is like, this is great. You are the problem. Yeah. Uh, so in either case, you've got that. You've got you've got the wh where you fit the player characters is where the st where where you can develop the story. So it doesn't matter either case, utopian or dystopian, because mm -hmm. it could be dystopian for them and great for everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. So we talked about super plagues and how it's way easier if there's just humans, uh, such as in your example of uh, a setting. Um, while it's it complicated when you have all those other races and dragons and things like that with super plagues. Uh, uh, terrible super disasters that disrupt the, the ways of life. And also the idea of starting right during it, where the players are actually, the player characters are actually kind of involved in either failing to stop the disaster or being the cause of the disaster unknowingly or knowingly, based on what mm. kind of player characters you got. And then they're living through that experience in the chaos before it settles out. Or you're dealing with a timeline where this terrible, crazy thing happened long ago and you have come to some kind of rhythm to like the mm. new norm basically the new normal of what is the new norm on. is the most attractive if you're building a dystopian setting i strongly suggest weaving into it a way that the norm can be the dystopian setting that it's self-perpetuating people really really want to feel like this is what it is not it's going to get better or it's going to get worse they want a norm well because they know what to expect at that point and they can Precisely. set up how they're going to act as their character accordingly based on those expectations. Mm -hmm. So there is, it is helpful to have that norm for, for the people right. playing as well as the people who, you know, how they develop their characters and how they play them. And then uh, what else did we talk about? We talked about your, your setting and you went through meh. it. It's meh. That was there. <laughs> oh, I like it. Whatever. <laughs> I wrote it years ago and I've written other ones since then, but yeah. It was a fun one to write. And I don't recall, uh, we talked about a lot of things, but mostly like the nitty gritty of things, but overall. Right. Um... And it is, I would say a warning or a caution. If you're writing a dystopian setting, try and accept that there is going to be, well, technically this is this, or well, technically that is that, or they're going to be little hangups. If you made it really fun and your players are really enjoying it, ignore the loopholes and pitfalls. Just ignore them. As long as everyone at the table is enjoying your setting, it's a good setting. That's literally the qualifier. Did they have fun? If they had fun, you did it right. So, and I've, I've had, I'm a stickler on those things. I know people who are sticklers on all things. My own developed worlds go through multiple iterations where I hand them to people that are going to intentionally ravage them. So just just if, if your players are having fun, whatever. And if there comes a time when a player says, hey, I was thinking, what about this? Say magic and just move on and keep having fun. <laughs> Clark tech or magic, just that works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Clark Tech being technology that's so beyond what you think is, nor is normal that it seems to be magic, basically. So it's indistinguishable. Right. So anyway, either one of those will work for whatever you got to, whatever you got to like, Band-Aid you got to stick on your setting when you're developing. Right. If you've got to Band-Aid something, magic. Mm -hmm. Unless it's dwarves eating mushrooms, then somebody, uh. somebody here is going to have a problem with it. <laughs> oh, so stupid. I'm so stupid. All right. They might eat some mushrooms, but that is not their primary, their staple of their diet is not mushrooms. It's so dumb. So with that, <laughs> let us know what you think in the comments below. While you're at it, like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. <laughs>